Welcome to Business with Beers, a podcast for business owners who want to scale their business to massively grow their income and contribution by investing in people, process, and technology. I am your host, Brian Beers. In this episode, we've got a fantastic show with Jamie Gruber. He is an entrepreneur in the real estate space, a business coach, and a multifamily investor. In this episode, Jamie shares his story about leaving a 21-year career W-2 job to focus full-time on his businesses that he built up on the side, which include a multifamily investing meetup group that he's expanding across the country, a mastermind program called Emerge and Ascend that's part of the GoBundance Network, and his multifamily investment portfolio. Jamie shares some gold nuggets on developing processes, how to use a disk profile to find people who complement your skill sets, how to set good goals, and most importantly, how to become the future version of yourself to achieve these goals. And if you enjoy this episode, please share it with your friends, rate and comment with your favorite part to help us reach more people. And if you like to learn more about the topics covered in this podcast, please check out brianbeers.com to sign up for my free weekly newsletter delivering content directly to your inbox. So welcome to the show, Jamie. Thank you, man. I pray- Glad to be here. I'm really uh, happy for you with this podcast and looking forward to this. Great, great. Well, this wouldn't be business with beers if I didn't ask you. We could have, uh, be at a bar, have a cold one. What are we drinking? You know, it's funny. If it were a beer, I'll go with uh, Blue Moon, only because I'm kind of a sweet tooth kind of guy. So I'm not a huge beer guy. I'm sure you have better answers from a lot of guys that come on or gals that come on. But uh, my my secret, uh, and I might get kicked off the show before it gets started, my secret favorite drink is Malibu and Coke. Okay. All right. Can I, can I stay? I thought you were going to say Apple Teeny, so that's good. Well, it's not far off. <laughs> going to wrong. It's, it's pretty close. All right. Fantastic. So if you could share your story, who are you, where do you live, what do you do, and then we'll go from there. Yeah, so I'm a native New Yorker uh, via Boston and now live in Michigan, all with my uh, with my now former W-2 career. I, um, I'll i start with I'm a father and a husband. I've been married to my wife, Sylvia, for 10 years, almost 11 now. We've got two young boys, six and three, uh, and that's my life. I love everything about being a dad, being a husband. It's, it's a fantastic uh, life to live. Uh, job career wise, uh, when I got out of college, I jumped into the insurance industry, insurance claims industry, actually. So I uh, started as a claims adjuster, auto claims adjuster. So people get in accidents, car accidents, I can, I would, you know, handle their claim, settle their injury, so on and so forth. And I was, I was pretty good at it. Uh, about a year and a half later, I was promoted to supervisor a year after that to a manager level job. And then I jumped around a little bit at that level, taking different kind of roles to round out skill sets. Uh, it moved me from Boston to New, I'm sorry, from New York to Boston. I lived there uh, for about nine years and I took on different jobs that required some of me to travel about 40, 45 weeks a year. I was on a plane in some roles um, or take on departments that were sort of brand spanking new, which fueled a little bit of entrepreneurship in me because it was while on, in the confines of a company, I had to figure out the systems, the processes, the staffing models for uh, for this particular organization. I had a lot of fun and it kind of it kind of got my appetite wet on the idea of maybe maybe unleashing my inner entrepreneur that I wasn't even sure if I had in me. Um, but as time went on, I was looking for that next level. And um, I eventually took a position in Michigan as a director, which is sort of an equity level position, um, uh, an executive level position, you know, 40,000 people in the company. I was probably in the top, I don't know, three, 400, something like that. So, you know, pretty prominent job and one that I had been kind of pushing my whole career, my whole 21 year career uh, toward. Um, Around that same time, I kind of got the bug for real estate investing. I had read Rich Dad, Poor Dad. I sort of learned the cash flow quadrant and realized I was fully in the E, in the employee part of it, and wanted to learn how I can move toward, you know, investor and business owner at some point and started buying real estate. We we scaled up to, in the last three, four years, about 40 doors uh, across a couple of multifamily properties and a couple of duplexes. Um, We've moved a couple of things around in there, but learned a lot about real estate in that time. And that was around the same time that I made this move to Michigan and took on this executive level job. When I when I uh, when I um, uh, started doing the, the real estate stuff, it kind of it kind of got me interested in maybe building a community around that. And I built a, a community called Multifamily and More. Uh, it's a networking community, a bunch of chapters across the country. And uh, the goal of it is really just to sort of serve our membership with content, with networking, with a bunch of information that they can use to further their their investing career. And I've learned a lot about the idea of community and I've developed a real passion for that. So that's kind of the long and short of uh, of what I do. <laughs> okay, great. Yeah, that's that's quite a, quite a journey. And uh, taking... Take, so are you still working in the insurance job? 
No, I actually recently left. Um, we're both in a mastermind called GoBundance, and I got a lot of encouragement from from the guys in that community, which is all entrepreneurs around what's next for you and really forced me to think about my next steps. And I've decided recently with uh, my, my real estate, with the multifamily more community that I built, as well as um, uh, a GoBundance product called Emerge and Ascend, which we can talk about later. Between those three, it was a lot, plus my family, and I had my day job and I opted to go with uh, all of the others and leave the day job just in the last few weeks. So, Okay. Well, and, and a lot of, I mean, a lot of risk in some ways, but also in, unlocks a lot more freedom that you now have all this time to continue to reinvest in yourself and invest in everything you do to continue to build these multiple streams of income that you got. Yeah, um, yep, 100%. I did kind of like, and I actually learned this from a GoBundance guy, kind of an asymmetric risk analysis to your point about that. It was sort of like, okay, how much do I truly need a month, you know, as far as living expense, family, you know, mortgage, all that stuff. And, you know, it was sort of nice to see we live fairly modestly, you know, for the income I was making, especially. And I've got real estate income that, that you know, kind of covers that, if you will, or helps with that at least. So, so that was one piece of it. And then the other part was, well, I've got some savings, I've got some money, I've got some other avenues that if I really focus on can generate revenue for me or generate income for me. And the worst case, I mean, I can be, I'm employable to 50 to 80 grand a year at a very minimum. Like I could get a job, yeah. you know, like, I yeah. won't be living under a bridge, you know? So that's the low end. The low end is I got to get a job. But to your point, the high end, it just felt uncapped and infinite and exponential. So the the risk analysis, again, asymmetrically was like, okay, uh, uh, infinite up top end with a limited bottom end. I'm going to go ahead and take the shot. Yep. So that was the decision process. Yeah, that's great. So one of the things you mentioned was when you're in the insurance companies, you were given an opportunity to kind of be an entrepreneur in a sense where you were put in charge of a certain department. Can you speak to maybe some of the things you learned there? Uh, it sounds like a pretty unique um, kind of job you had. Maybe you could speak to that a little bit. Yeah, I learned, you know, the other side of systems and processes. I'd always been sort of somebody that partook in what was already existing, right? Somebody else built the process, somebody else built the systems. So this forced me to really sit down and say, okay, not only do I need to make sure the work gets done, but I need to do it in such a way that it's sustainable and repeatable so that the people in my organization have a sense of structure and best practices to leverage. Like I never had to do that before. So I learned the value of systems and processes. I learned the value of leveraging uh, people, or I started to learn the value of that. It took a big step when I took the director role, that that executive position, I can explain that in a bit, but I started to learn the value of leveraging people, kind of the who, um, of who's who I'm surrounding myself with and what I needed from each of these people and, you know, being clear with expectations for what they needed to do in order for us to not only, uh, you know, build, but then scale, if you will, that particular organization that I was in charge of. Okay. So let's go to the process. So what specifically makes a good process? Or you, you had a, how would you identify if you needed to make a process? And then what, what was your kind of brainstorming steps of how you went to try to solve it? So one, again, lesson number one was bring people in. Uh, meaning, you know, I started initially, and I still do this from time to time, it's my, my Achilles heel. Like I will think of the process and lay it all out. And I think I've got to figure it out. So it's like, oh, okay, I, I laid down the steps that I think it needs to take. And then very quickly, if you just try to roll that out, your credibility comes into question because you've left guaranteed you've missed there's gaps in what you thought was the right process so the first thing i would do whenever we were implementing something major as we started to learn what this business this organization really needed to do was bring in a mixed group of folks leaders individual contributors you know people that work outside the organization that could look in just sort of a board of advisors, if you will, to help build the process. So first and foremost, it was getting more eyes early on what we were trying to do so that we had more brains sort of working the problem. That was number one. Number two um, was was being very, very clear and not assuming and not assuming any step is assumable, if that makes sense. And what I mean is, you know, you may think that, you know, well, everybody's going to understand that between step two and three, obviously, in order to get from there to there, this has to happen, whatever that might be there. You know, it's so obvious, but I, I made that mistake and still make that mistake often of making that assumption. And, you know, for some folks, it's not as obvious or they're really, really good at file following instructions. That's their gift. Mine is I'll figure it out. But for some folks, they need that clear set of instructions. So getting really granular and specific every step of the way was another thing. And this might seem a bit tactical, but the other, the third piece was where I can be visual, be visual. So in building the process, screen capturing uh, in my entrepreneurial endeavors, I use Loom quite a bit for my VA. So Loom's a great system to like screen capture, record you, just 
putting together exactly what you need somebody to do, an assistant, a virtual assistant, whatever. So using something like that, so there's a visual medium, again, a screen capture in a process to help people kind of guide themselves through what you need them to do. It just eliminates, I've learned, work on my end or having to take calls or whatever to explain something because you know, they just didn't, they couldn't see it. People learn and see things in different ways. So those are three elements I yep. would say. Yeah, those are all great. I think, yeah, Loom's an excellent resource. That's one I also picked up when, especially trying to train a new VA or, or even someone locally, which is we, we record what we want to do, us doing the task, we send them the video. And the best part is that person leaves, we still have the training material. I don't have to go and redo a video or a live like Zoom call, for example, which is the old way I used to do it. Hey, let me just hop on Zoom. I'll show you how to do it. Now it's I record it, I send it to them. And so uh, 100%. it's even happened yeah. recently. Yeah, hundred percent. Yep. Yep. I was yeah. going to say too, the other thing I do with my VI, I have her record uh, the process when she's creating it on Loom so that if she does have to walk away, like the next VA can watch the old VAs record. I probably should check on those more for quality control, <laughs> but, uh, but it is a, yeah. to your point, it is a great, great tool just to make sure things are in place. Yeah. We're, we're, we're expanding. So we're going to hire more VA. So I need that VA to train my second one to do the similar process for that new market. And so, um, yeah, duplicating those efforts, however you can make it easy for people. Um, the other thing we found which with, in writing processes, especially on a technology basis, is sometimes it gets outdated too. So if you spend all this time writing this big expansive document of how to do things, and then it, you know, the next day it becomes out of date, um, well, at least in video, like you could just record a new video and you're kind of done. Um, but then sometimes people just need a quick reference guide. So it's kind of a, a combination of, of both. Um, so that's 100%. great. What else? Um, what else did you learn from that whole process? You said people, what about hiring people, identifying the right people, um, finding good who's, any tips yeah, there? So so we had, as a company, we had, that part was sort of defined, our, our hiring process was defined. But the one thing that, you know, and this is corporate America or even in, in you know, for folks that are business owners, entrepreneurs, um, what I learned in that time, especially, was that my penchant or my bias was to hiring like people to me, right? And we, you know, I like the disc profile, you can use um, uh, enagrams or whatever it might be, but I would identify in somebody like, okay, they're like me, I get that. Mm -hmm. And and when I took on that role, and now especially being sort of entrepreneurial and having, having people that I'm hiring or people that I'm bringing in, uh, even if it's on a consulting basis, I fully look for the opposite of me. So the first thing is understanding what I am or who I am. Some people say these personality profiles don't work, whatever. I, I don't know if they work, don't work, but they at least give you a sense of the direction of what you are, what you're great at. So for me, I'm more of an outgoing, moving fast, forward, you know, thinking, visionary yep. type of yeah, guy. You're an I with it, probably some D, right? 100%. I'm yep. exactly that. I'm an ID if, they, if you're losing, if you're using disc. Yep. I look, I look hard for C's. They frustrate the hell out of me. Don't get me wrong. But at the same time, they give me, they give me that balance I need. They give me that other side. As I talked about earlier, whether it's like finding the holes in my process or just reining me in sometimes like, okay, well, you realize wanting me to do that is in contradiction to what you said yesterday, which is like, oh, good point. Let's table this and go yeah, with yeah. yesterday. Just having somebody there to hold me to, you know, uh, to, to moving forward. So finding somebody with, with uh, complementary skill sets um, as was what I learned then and I've taken with me since. Yeah, that, that's a great one. Yeah, you want to surround yourself with people sometimes that you like, but then, like you said, it you might, uh, if you're both good at one thing, but neither of you are good at another thing, now you have that weakness. So uh, yeah, I mean, there's certain values I look for regardless if you're a C and I, a D or whatever. Sure, like yeah. I want you to be pro uh, proactive, right? I want you to be somebody that can, can take on a task and do it. I want you to have a certain energy. I want to feel good about you. Like just because you're a C, but I, you know, I just, this is a weird, I, I'm not gonna, I don't want to work in that environment. I want to yep. like look at the phone and be like, oh, okay, I guess I'll take this call, you know? So for sure, it's uh, it's gotta be somebody that you like and trust and can get along with, but I do look for those other skill sets. Yep, my, my brother's my business partner. He's the opposite of me. I'm more the ID as well, and he's more the SC. And, uh, you know, we'll, uh, he'll definitely rein me in and remind me about things we're supposed to talk about, which I totally forgot about uh, from the previous day. So it's, uh, yeah, it's definitely a good balance to have. So that's funny. That's this is it. My my business partner and my multifamily, like I do the podcasts, I get out, I yep. talk, I do all that stuff. He's in a basement with a spreadsheet and he loves it. You know, that's we just have our roles yep. and uh and they're clearly defined. So yeah. Yep. Hey, let's go on to your networking uh company. Let's talk just a little bit about that. What does that look like? What's your role in it? How do you start it? How are you growing it? 
Yeah, we started it as just a, hey, uh, nobody's talking about multifamily at any of these local real estate meetups. Like, you know, we find like one other guy there. And some of the meetups were just like profit centers. That's all they were about. I don't mind, it's a business. I don't mind a meetup being a business, but it, there was not a value being given, I thought, in return for what they were asking for. They were there just to market their, like, you know, their wholesaling business or their turnkey business or whatever, the hosts of these meetups. But I never got true value out of them. They just didn't feel like they, they gave me anything. Um, so two things for us, it was like, okay, either there's no multi or multifamily meetups have started and they fail because nobody's interested or nobody's done it. So we started a multifamily meetup and we called it multifamily and more just so that we could talk about other things in case the multifamily wasn't interesting. <laughs> we didn't know what it was going to yeah. be. Multifamily and more. And it became like everybody that showed up for the first meetup, multifamily uh, interest, the next meetup, the next meetup. And we started to really get to be known in our market for multifamily. And at the time I was part of different masterminds and people in other uh, uh, communities, like I'm in, in Michigan, Ann Arbor, Michigan area, people in Cleveland and South Florida and San Francisco were like, hey, I like what you're doing. I don't, I don't even know how to start a meetup. So I wrote out a process, kind of learning from that prior job and said, well, this is what we did. And then one of them had the idea like, hey, can we just call it like multifamily and more Cleveland? I'm like, sure. So we just sort of <laughs> built out this very soft, a uh, franchise model, if you will, of like, hey, let's get more out there with the value proposition being, hey, we're putting out content on our core platforms like YouTube and Instagram and all that stuff. But, you know, the more we're out there, the more people will know us, identify with us, like and trust us and want to bring property to us or bring investment deals to us. And everything we've done so far has been through that. Everything has been through networking. So um, that's kind of what we did. But now we've gotten much more intentional with you know, the leaders of each chapter having uh, defined roles, you know, we're bringing contracts into play. The last two chapters, we actually sold uh, chapter, sold the chapters, like we, we, we charged like a franchising fee of them. Mm -hmm. So we're kind of, you know, making sure that they have, and it's, it's not even like the, it's not even like it's big money. We give them a banner, we give them some different things to kind of like, you know, give value back, but it's more, we started a few chapters that were just, yeah, hey, go ahead and start it. And then the, the host did nothing with them and their Facebook group is overrun with spam and they never host a meetup and it's just sort of a black eye on the brand. So we want some barrier to entry, people that are truly committed and monetary is one of the best barriers to entry there are, right? I mean, so we have 40, 50 different applicants actually right now. And if we sign up two or three, cool, because we know they're committed and they're paying. Mm -hmm. So that's part of the business model. But the rest of it is really building it into kind of an event and content company. So we're we're starting the plans for a national event. Uh, again, we put out content all the time. We're selling sponsorships nationally to a couple of, of bigger players that are out there. So it's it's become a a place where we attract people with deals people message me all the time with deals now more than i can even look at at times you know people want to invest with us and we've got lists built for our for our uh, potential capital partners in the future um that's a nice benefit to us but the brand itself i get a lot of joy in providing value and part of the way that we're continuing to build and systematize that and monetize it is through sponsorships selling chapters and and creating events that will you know, we'll charge uh, uh, ticket prices for that will be part of the, the brand strategy. So okay. that's where what we're going with it. What does it cost a local investor to be a member in Cleveland or wherever? Nothing. Uh, to be a, just to join, to be a member, it's completely free. free. Okay. Yep, so you're, you're monetizing it through the other ways that you just Correct. mentioned. Yep. Events, yep. conferences. Everything else is completely free. If you want to attend our national conference, you'll pay for that. If you want to be yep. a chapter leader, you'll pay for that. But to come to or be a part of our, our chapter, completely free. If the local chapter leader charges like 10 bucks and provides food at their local chap their local meeting, I mean, that's up to them. But for the most part, it's completely free. The guy who buys your local um, meetup franchise, whatever you want to call it, what is, how does he monetize it? Why would so, you buy it? Sponsor, well, so uh, uh, sponsorships is one. So they can sell local sponsorships to local sponsors. Okay. Um, that Insurance they companies, get, banks, income. whoever. Correct, okay. title companies, that kind of thing. Yep. So they can sell their their uh, their sponsorships. And then honestly, the biggest, the biggest thing is the reason why we put a financial barrier in place is what we learned is the more consistent we were, the more we would see, you know, brands like ours come up and go away. Meaning we were the ones that stayed the course. Mm. We put a monetary barrier in front of it. They start their chapter, they maintain it. What we've seen for us and what we've seen with our more involved chapters is they're attracting capital, they're attracting deals. That's the real, where the money is, if you will, to be a chapter leader or to be a, a meetup yep. leader at all. And we, when we do our calls with potential chapter leaders, I go through what is a good meetup. I give them everything on that call free. Like this is yep. what makes a great meetup. And then if you wanna join with us, here's what you gotta do. If not, take everything I just gave you and start your meetup, go for it. You know, I think there's value in, in doing it. 
by joining with us, we've got a bit more of a national footprint. We bring you know bigger speakers in for sort of our national events, um, and we give some benefits to to members that are in our community, like a monthly virtual mastermind and stuff like that. So um, there's yeah. benefit to being part of the brand, but honestly, like just being a meetup leader who consistently and I mean a year, two, three years of consistently delivering and hosting a meetup will return you value if you're a value focused person. So that's that's kind of what yep. our, our our core values are to give more, be more and do more with give more being the lead of it. So, OK, yeah, there's a quote, you know, proximity you know, equals power. And so the more someone is out there and, and being that that face of that meetup, you know, they're all, all the investors and everyone's going to recognize them as you know, kind of the thought leader in the platform, even if they're only just a little bit more knowledgeable and experienced than the members, it's just yeah. they're the one up on stage. And for the leader, it's a lot of value to that. And for the other people that participate and are active and give presentations, and uh, that's where the real value is for them. So I'm, I'm sure they, I'm sure they get a lot out of it. Yeah, I, I've said before, like people ask like, oh, I don't really have, when we started, we had no multifamily property. I had two duplexes and a single family, that's it. And I, but I never ever purported to be the multifamily guy. It was like, hey, look, I'm good at connecting, bringing, to get, bringing people together. I like learning with others. I like growing with others. That's what this is. I'm happy to organize it. And as time's gone on, we've bought some property. So we have a little bit of expertise, but there are guys and gals in our communities that are, you know, syndicating thousands of units way ahead of me. And I never claim to know what they know. In fact, I get to, I get to network with them. They see me as credible simply because I put together communities around what they do, right? Like, okay, great. You've done that. I'm meeting other people here. So yeah, you only need to be, you don't even need to be, but I say you can only be a chapter ahead uh, to add value, right? One chapter ahead and you're giving people value if you're, if you're explaining you know, what you've learned and, and are open with it for sure. Yep. You mentioned you have 40 uh, approximately uh, rentals, doors. Uh, what is your goal there? How big do you More, want to I, I, you know, I, <laughs> we used to have a, a thing like 505 was our thing when I have 500 units in five years. Honestly, my goal is simply to get that to a point where, where passively I'm making, you know, uh, whatever, 100 or 200 grand a year, 10,000 a month, uh, you know, somewhere in that range. So, you know, I just want to have enough to support my life. When I first started, it's funny, when I first started with, with the whole multifamily and real estate thing, I, I had a goal of, yes, I want to be in real estate, right? Mm -hmm. And as I started to do that, it's like, man, I love real estate. I love the wealth building tool, but I'm not an operator. That's not my strength. That's not my gift. That's not my passion. I don't like some guys wake up every day and they love the operations of being in a multifamily business. When I started building the multifamily and more community, I learned that I enjoy attracting capital. I enjoy the, the interactive piece. So like investor relations is my role in mm. our, in our multifamily business, right? Building communities and doing all of that while real estate for me becomes a uh, like a, a wealth builder. It's the best wealth builder in the world and a passive income source, but it's not what I want to do day to day, if that makes sense. So we put management in place when we buy a property. We have specific systems to make that as 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 hands off as a general partner can be. I mean, you got to have some hands on no matter what, if you're owning real estate, unless you're a complete limited partner. And I don't want to be a limited partner, but you know, we meet with our management companies each month. You know, we go, I drive by my properties, you know, once a month at least to check on things. You know, we have certain things that we give our managers a checklist to do. Like every every three months, you know, we have hard water in one building. Every three months I need somebody to flush the hot water tanks, you know, <laughs> that kind of thing. Um, every, you know, every six months, you know, you're changing the alarm, you're changing this, you're gonna do a, a refresh every spring, power wash the buildings, you know, uh, uh, you know, do some some work in the flower beds. You know what I mean? Like we give them very clear instructions and then I just drive by and make sure it's getting done. So as much as I can be limited as a general partner, I want to be, but I love real estate for what it is, which is wealth building and passive income. Um, so that's that's yeah. my real and role in that. Both of those speak to your previous, which was the process, right? Writing all those checklists and processes and expectations, setting very clear expectations. And then also finding who's, right? Finding those partners who are the good operators where you still can be a part of it. You can be the visionary, but you find people who are better at the things that you're not at or you just don't want to do because you're not passionate about it. So 100%, 100%. that's good. Uh, that's, that is the benefit of real estate is it, it's a team sport, as they say. And uh, you can participate in any capacity that, that makes sense to your strengths. Yeah, so. to your point, there's a there's a property we're going to go look at, and I'm so excited to go walk this property to get to take a look at it, to get a sense of it, work with my partner on analyzing it, and bring it under contract. Right from that point on, my partner I hand it to him essentially, right, to get it to closing, and then once it's closed, we hand it to the property manager, and then we check in with it. You know, so like my role in that is that upfront part. I I'm pumped to make this drive out to Cleveland and look at this property hopefully next okay. week. Um, but yeah, we'll see where it goes from there. All right. do, do you syndicate? Do you have outside investors that come in and, or just kind of small partnerships more than maybe syndications? 
to we created a fund thinking that's the route we wanted to go and as we learn more from other syndicators it's like it's a great model but we may or may not it's, it's we're sort of in on the fence with this i think i like the jv model better like where we own everything with a partner or two partners that are bringing in capital they own a percentage of the building like we like that model a little bit better just more control it's whatever your goals are right if your goals are to scale a huge operation and make a ton in you know acquisition fees and you know just if you really enjoy if you enjoy the business of real estate getting on conference calls and webinars and pitching the job idea to to a, a, a sea of investors cool my goal is again to be on the beach as passive as possible i don't want to be taking investor calls when i'm on the beach whenever that is like i'm not saying for life i'm not that guy but i want to go away for a month which we've done i want to go away for a month right like i want yeah. i want to know that it's my property you know it's two three of us dealing with that property they know where i am i know where they are and i don't have to continue to churn and buy new property to then sell it in seven years like so right now I'm not we're not moving towards syndication we're sticking with more of a JV model. Okay. Yeah, that's great. Yeah, syndication's more of, of a full-time job of yeah. managing investors and 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 it's kind of like you're flipping these properties like you said it's every 5 to 7 years. That's really when they get paid out is they uh they resell or they refinance and it's, it's no doubt a, a job. The rewards can be huge, but it's a job more than yeah. like you said the joint venture or doing it kind of on your own or with your team is more of a passive uh, a model. So Hey, great. Let's let's move to GoBundance. Uh, if you could speak, maybe what is GoBundance, and then kind of what is Emerge and Ascend uh, from there. Sure. GoBundance is uh, so. There's a book called Tribe of Millionaires that might that written by the GoBundance founders. That might be the best describe description of it. It's a it's a tribe of millionaires. What's the tagline? It's a tribe of healthy, wealthy, generous people that choose to live epic lives. Right. So this is a group of. There's a men's tribe and a women's tribe. The men's tribe is a little bit more um, further down the road. The women's is newer. So I'll speak to that group. But it's a group of guys, what, 400 of us or so, that um, have achieved a million net worth or more, which is which sounds great. But, you know, we all we all feel middle class. No, please. We, I think we all are middle class still, but uh, a million plus in net worth. So higher net worth, but are looking to be whole life millionaires. So it's more than just, you know, how much money can we make? How much wealth can we build? But how can we be the best dads? How can we be the best husbands? How can we be ourselves, our best selves? spiritually how can we contribute more all of that so really balanced living the balanced life having it all it's a group of guys all charging toward that through through content communication and accountability really that's probably the best description i have of it so emerge and ascend there's a quick story here is i i built this multi-family and more community um uh the the founders of GoBundance were always looking for a way to build something that was for people that aren't yet qualified for GoBundance, but want to be kind of part of the culture, the ecosystem of GoBundance. So below million in net worth, but want to get there one day and maybe stay connected to the GoBundance community, get proximity to it. So I sat down with them at an event we had in Breckenridge last August, and uh, they said, hey, you know, you built this community with multifamily, you know, we're looking to build a community here. What do you think? And I laid out, you know, they already had identified like an emerge and ascend. That's what the two products are called. And I laid out what I thought that would be and what we ended up executing. So Emerge is a 12 week goal setting course with weekly content and it's got and a community around it. It's got three goals that I put or three objectives. First is for you to get transformation. So that is you set a goal when you enter Emerge with tools and, and, and content that we give you. And the goal is to leverage the, the community for accountability and the content to get to achieving that goal by the end of the 12 weeks. And it's really cool to see the the testimonials that are coming in now talking about, man, I set this goal, you know, week one, not not even know that I, I like, ah, this is too pie in the sky and I actually exceeded it or, or whatever. Or even if people say, I set the goal, I didn't quite meet it, but man, I've got more tools and I understand the value of proximity now more than I ever did before. So that's the 12 weeks. That's one of the goals is to create transparency. Can you share, uh, for example, what are, what are some of those goals that people had set? Yeah. So one guy set a goal to, he said, I want to make a hundred thousand and in flipping income in three months. He got pushed by the community to set it 150. He hit 162. Uh, another guy wanted to buy one rental property within the 12 weeks. His first rental property ended up buying two within the 12 weeks. Somebody else set a goal to get their first uh, Airbnb vacation rental under contract and was able to achieve that. Somebody had a goal of losing, I think it was 30 pounds and they hit that or just came very close to that, like 25 pounds or something like that. Um, in fact, one guy the other day said um, in, in a post something like, um, uh, I have all these new clothes that I bought like six months ago and I don't, they don't fit me anymore after Emerge because I've lost so much weight. Best compliment in the world. He's got to go spend more money for clothes, but really cool to see that transformation can, for them. So those are some of the goals. Awesome. Can you, can you speak to maybe your philosophy on setting these goals? Do you go big like Grant Cardone 10X or is it kind of 
uh, something that's more achievable, something in between? What's your, how do, how do you, I, how do you coach somebody to set a goal? I like, target? well, so there's, we, th we cover the first four steps in, in emerge of goal setting. One is, is to have, first you have to have a clearly defined vision and we walk you through exactly how to do that. Second is you have to establish your goal using a certain, a certain layout, which we go through in, uh, in emerge. Third is you have to put the habits in place because to me, what goal setting is about is not achieving the goal or getting that goal. It's becoming the person that achieves that goal, right? So the habits that you put in place today and just like kind of, yeah, you look at your vision every day, you look forward at your vision, but then every day you look down at your habits and execute those habits in 12 weeks. When you look up, suddenly it's like, wow, I, I all I did was these same things every day and boom, I hit my goal, right? So you have to establish what those habits are that support your goal and how you're going to execute them. And then the fourth is how do you how do you week by week plan? Because you could set a goal, create a vision, have habits, but you got to sit down each week and really map out how you're going to move toward what you're trying to every week. So those are the four steps. As far as size of goal, um, I, I go with the smart model. So this is you know having something specific, measurable, appropriate, reasonable, and time bound. And that appropriate and reasonable, I think, are are it depends on you. It's it's kind of a there's a there's a, a range there. I I don't. There's the philosophy of, if I were to skew one way, it's probably the philosophy of, you know, reach for the moon if you miss your land amongst the stars. So set it real. If you want a million dollars, you say, I want a million dollars, but you only make 600 grand. It's not bad, right? But yeah. a lot of people punish themselves with that. So I really look at the individual, if I'm going to coach somebody one-on-one, -on -one, like what's their, what's their personality type? Like if they're like me and they're just sort of like, whatever, man, everything's good. Everything's happy and successful. It doesn't matter. Then set the goal big, set it for the stars, yeah. set it for as high as you can go. But if you're somebody who, who loses confidence, if they don't do what they say, if they feel like a lack of integrity within themselves, then I would have them set that goal with a little stretch, maybe a little outside of their comfort zone from what they want to do, but still closer to it, if that makes sense. So I think it's a very individual thing. I think the key point too, is that when you achieve that goal, you, you have to be satisfied with it, right? You yeah. set this goal that's 10% better and you hit it and you're like, well, it doesn't feel, I don't feel any different, right? right? If that flipper you mentioned was doing 90,000 a month or whatever, and now he's making a hundred, it's like, what's the difference, right? But 150, it was a big goal. And I don't know, maybe he was making 50, maybe he's already double, maybe three X it, but sure. it's, it's, you achieve it, you feel different. You're, you're proud of your results. I think that's like the key to it. And then whatever it is from there, you know, it is what it is, but yeah, that's, that's gold. Is there some goal setting gold nuggets right there? So, yep. uh, then what's, what's next after that? So we got the goal set, yep. um, continue, continue. Yeah. So finishing off emerged, uh, objective one is transformation in 12 weeks. Objective two is proximity. So we do a lot of, uh, stuff that we bring in GoBundance folks, you know, once a month, at least, uh, to come down and talk about what they do in their business. And I, I insist that we do Q and a through live, like don't put it in the chat. I want you on screen featured with this GoBundance member so that you get to meet them and ask your question directly. So proximity is big. And we even had like a, a guy saying his goal was to buy a dental practice in 12 weeks. That's his eMERGE goal. Well, we got a guy in the tribe that owns five of them. So why don't I put you two together? If you're serious, this guy in GoBundance will get together with you. And they both texted me like, great conversation. This guy's buying a dental practice. You just watch. Like, you know, so he's got the support now of a GoBundance member in the same space as him. So that proximity to me uh, is very valuable. And then third, we use eMERGE as a filtering tool. So People can buy a course, right? Uh, any course they want, but do they actually do anything with it? So our test for that is, did you complete 12 of 12 assignments on time? You complete 12 of 12 assignments, then we'll invite you into Ascend. And Ascend is the annual mastermind. And in there we've got, I, we're doing it two different ways. I'm working outside in with folks, meaning we're going to give you tactics. We're going to bring in speakers around health, around wellness, around uh, wealth, around you know building your vertical so you can create horizontal income. So you're going to get that external uh, uh, information that you can bring inside and figure out what exactly you want to do with that. But then we're also looking to work inside out. So in other words, let's deconstruct the individual over the course of, a, of the first year and ascend and really get to the heart of what what do they feel like their true purpose is? So the goal is to be a whole life millionaire. That's what GoBundance is. So you go through Ascend, hopefully you hit that millionaire status in a year or two, and boom, you jump to GoBundance and you're part of that community with millionaires. But in order to get there, in order to become a whole life millionaire, me throwing a whole bunch of tactics at you is good, but I want to help you deconstruct, find purpose, find that fulfillment that you're looking for so that you can really work with a solid foundation inwardly or inside 
to build yourself up toward being in, in that whole life millionaire and going, going to go abundant. So that's the that's the the, the the cherry, if you will, is can you get to ascend and be around amazing people? And it looks exactly like go abundance. We have go pods. We've got you know accountability pods. That is, we've got you know micro tribes. We've got different different content streams every month. We've got uh, in-person meetings, you know, all of that. So it's it's go abundance without the millionaire net worth, but you got to clear emerge. You got to emerge before you can ascend is kind of the tagline for it. So, yep. so you know, I joined go abundance in February last year. And when I looked at to it, you know, all the things you said, it's kind of like, what's the catch, right? There's all this like, you know, it all sounds great, but then like, what's what's the catch? What are they going to try to sell me the whole time? Yeah. And, uh, and I could say, you know, over the last now it's 14 months since I've uh, joined i've probably i've developed personally more in 14 months than i have probably in 14 years okay. in terms of learning about goal setting and you know mindset and what are what are good habits and uh you know all these things that you know you, you think the world like operates in a certain way like how do you get a loan or how do you do this but then you, you learn about all these these guys doing these amazing things that just blow your mind and and you realize it's n- nothing's like the way you think it is and yeah. that it can be anything that you want and, um, but you got to commit yourself. Like you said, you got to, you can't just, you can't just show up. Like you got to take action. You got to be committed to achieving the goals and, and, and reading and educating and all this stuff. So yeah, it's, it's amazing what you're doing and, and leading this group. And, you know, I think Go Abundance will no doubt uh, be better off for it. So yeah, yeah. We've had like five guys go through and merge that were already qualified for Go Abundance and then jump to Go Abundance after when they got a sense, like to your point, like what's the catch? They joined a merge at a very low price point and said, okay, I get it. Put me in Go Abundance. You know, like like I'm, yeah. I, I didn't know exactly what, what it was going to be like, but I get it now. I get the culture. I get what the values are. I'm ready to go. So it is exciting to see some of these folks kind of filter through so far. Yep. Fantastic. So what's next for you? Um, just continue to focus on this. You're going to blow this thing up. Is that, is that that, yeah, so, so it's kind of a, a couple different things. Since I left my job, I you know I've always been sort of subordinate to my brands, right? So I had the multifamily and more brand, and anything I would do would be under that umbrella because I didn't want to be too visible to the day job, right? Same with Emerge in a sense, they under that umbrella because I didn't want to be too visible to the day job. So I'm working a lot on kind of my own personal brand being being more more out in front with these other brands, sort of subordinate to me, so that I could bring people to wherever they want. Real estate investing, cool. This is your spot. If you're looking for more of a of a of a drive toward being the best version of you that you can be, let me get you. Let me convince you why Emerge is the best place for you to go and and help you through that program. So it's really developing my personal brand and the learnings I've had are bringing in the right people to help me scale these. Because until when I jumped from like a manager to an executive to a director level, I kept doing the same things, right? And it was I was struggling until I removed the wrong people brought in the right people and saw like, wow, my day got easier, my life got easier and things are actually happening. And I've taken those lessons and have applied it to these sort of businesses that I built on the side, whether it's the multifamily business, multifamily and more the product or or emerge and ascend the product, it's bringing in the right people to scale that and just continuing to learn those lessons to make it, make it bigger and better. That's fantastic. So my final question is any book recommendations you have for perhaps yeah. some, you mentioned Tribe of Millionaires, which is great, you can get that on Amazon. Sure. Uh, what else are you reading? I'm going to give you two, if that's okay. So the first yeah. one is my kind of go-to, which is uh, the uh, Outwitting the Devil by Napoleon Hill. If you've never read that, it's sort of foundational to Think and Grow Rich. It's okay. it's like the story behind it. It was written in the 20s, released in 2012 or something like that because of some controversy around it. But fantastic book. He literally interviews the devil, like his version of what the devil interview would be like. It's pretty okay. cool. I've never Always heard recommend that, that one. Yeah, Recently, that one. I read a book called The Law of Abundance. I don't know how this book isn't more well known, but S.D. Buffington is the author. I can't find much on her, but the book is my my pod and I are reading it together. It's just it's on fire. It's a great book, just about truly how the concepts of abundance work, and uh, I'd recommend it to anybody. Great, great. So, where can people connect with you and learn more about uh, Send and multifamily and everything you're involved in? Yeah, so if you want to check out uh, uh, me, just anything is at the Jamie Gruber. So on Instagram at the Jamie Gruber, Facebook, uh, LinkedIn, Twitter, all at the Jamie Gruber. If you want to check out Emerge, just go abundance.com slash Emerge. You can read more about what the curriculum looks like and and all of that. Uh, for anybody that's looking to jump in, I'll just throw this out there. You can use the code Emerge to get hundred dollars off the course. Um, if you're looking at multifamily and more, just go to multifamilymore.com and you can check things out there. Fantastic. All right. Well, I appreciate you sharing today. Tons of tons of great advice. Um, and I wish you the best of luck. I appreciate it, man. Great connecting with you. All right. Thanks, Jamie.